Now, in Philippians chapter 2 here, I want you to keep this in mind as we look at this passage, and particularly the first two verses that we're going to look at. Uh, It's all a part of these first two verses. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now you know this, you've heard this, and that's probably one of the reasons you're in this church. Uh, We believe that salvation doesn't come by works. It's not your good works that saves you, it's the grace of God. Uh, Your good works don't keep you saved. It's by God's grace uh, that we're all saved tonight if you've asked Christ to come into your heart. Uh, So uh, this is not saying that you and I are to work for our salvation. But when we do get saved, our salvation begins to work out of our lives. Uh, The works that we do, uh, it is representative of the fact that Jesus Christ has come into our lives. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we look at the rest of this passage, uh, understanding that uh, what we're going to deal with tonight is a part of your salvation working out of you. Look at verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with you. Now, we have come to a point to where we have crossed a line here, and that line is the difference between preaching and meddling. And this passage will meddle with us. Now, notice, first of all, he says, don't murmur, don't complain. Normally, when we think about murmuring, we think about gossip. And it's a part of gossip, but it's not really gossip here that, uh, that I want to concentrate on. In the Bible, murmur means to complain in low tones, uh, to criticize or grumble about things. Uh, We see murmuring all around us, and we're all guilty of it. I know I am. We grumble about the weather. We grumble about the grocery prices. We grumble about gas prices. We grumble about the economy. We grumble about politics. We grumble about sports. Uh, We grumble at work. We grumble at home. We grumble at church. Uh, We're just a bunch of grumblers, amen? (laughs) Uh, We are. We're a bunch of grumblers. The murmurer always sees the negative side of things. Uh, Any of this sound familiar to you? Nothing is as easy as it looks. Have you ever said that? (laughs) Nothing is as easy as it looks. Everything takes longer than you think. How about this one? If anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. The other line always moves faster. I hate going to the grocery store for that reason. I always, always, always pick the wrong line. I don't care if I change five times. I pick the wrong line. Right? Uh, just the other day, I was at the grocery store in Brook Park, and uh, I saw the line. I said, well, that one's going to be too slow. So I got in another line, and then it took forever. I always seem to pick the wrong line. How about this one? The chance of bread falling with the peanut butter and jelly side down is directly proportional to the cost of the carpet. Inside every large problem is a series of small problems struggling to get out. 90% of everything is crud. Whatever hits the fan will not be evenly distributed. No matter how long or hard you shop for an item, After you bought it, it'll be on sale somewhere else cheaper. 
any tool dropped while repairing a car will automatically roll underneath to the exact center of the car. And then this last one, the repairman will never have seen a model quite like yours before. Murmurs are unhappy people. Murmurs always feel like they're being cheated. Murmurs always like to highlight the weaknesses of others. Murmurs love to fight. It makes them feel better about themselves when they're picking on somebody else's faults. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but grumblers can really suck the life out of the party. Grumblers are never happy, and they will never know the joy of true contentment. They play the part of the martyr. Nobody likes me. In Numbers chapter 14, you need not turn there, but you will recall that in Numbers chapter 14, uh, they sent spies. The Israelites uh, sent some spies out into the land that God had promised them. And those 12 spies went over and spied out the land uh, that God had told them was theirs. They came back with their report. And they talked about how good the land was and how fertile it was. I mean, it's just a great land. But then they started to murmur. The people over there are big and strong. And there's just absolutely no way that we can go in and possess this land. Well, God was fed up with their complaining. Because he had promised them the land. And they chose not to act in faith. So God decided that he would condemn these people to die in the wilderness. And so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because they chose to grumble and complain rather than to go in and possess the land that God had promised them. In 1 Corinthians, if you'll turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul points back to this occasion and he addresses it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and beginning in verse 10, he says this, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, I don't know if you caught this or not, but it's interesting that Paul talks about learning a lesson from the murmuring of the Israelites, and then he concludes it with this statement, flee from idolatry. Idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Now, that's not a coincidence. Paul realizes that murmuring is a sign that we are trusting our own opinion of things rather than God's opinion. Murmuring is a sign that we are trusting our strategies over God's strategies. Uh, We think we know better than God does. And we're actually playing the part of God. And my friend, when you play the part of God, you are committing idolatry. That's what it is. Notice, secondly, he says, do all things without murmuring and disputes. Disputing. The word for disputing here is dialogamos. It's where we get our word dialogue. And there's really two parts to this command here. Number one, don't argue with each other. Have you ever noticed that nothing good ever comes from arguing with each other? Nothing ever good comes. Tempers flare, good judgment disappears, and uh, nobody listens. You know why? Because you're waiting to, you're you're trying to prepare what you're going to say as soon as that person gets through saying what they said. And then we wonder why people are turned off to Christianity. When Jesus was accused, he chose to remain silent rather than to give his accusers cause for action. Wouldn't you think that's a good plan for you and I to adopt, to remain silent? Listen, folks, it's better to be mistreated 
than to turn anybody away from the gospel. It's better to be mistreated than to turn anybody away from the gospel. Secondly, and this is important, anytime you argue with God, you take a step toward rebellion. Anytime you argue with God, you take a step toward rebellion. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with you and I expressing our confusion and our frustration with the things of life. Uh, I've done that so many times. But do not ever attack God's wisdom. Don't ever attack God's wisdom. Uh, Listen to Job chapter 40 and verse 2. Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. So we need to stay away from murmuring and disputing. Now, let's not leave this yet. I know that we're probably all feeling guilty at this point uh, because I, I feel guilty every day of this thing of murmuring and complaining. But notice he says, do all things. A double L. All things. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Uh, Not just when things get tough, but do all things without murmuring and disputing. Uh, Might be a good time for us to have a Selah moment. (laughs) Uh, You know what Selah means, don't you? You find it in the Psalms, it means stop and think about it. Now stop and think about all the, the times that you murmur and complain. Now, there are some things we can do without murmuring and arguing. But all things? <laughs> all things? Uh, that's kind of like saying you have to give up all sweets. Wow, that would be tough, wouldn't it? Um, now, uh, is Brother Wee Sam here? Okay. He's gone too? All right. Uh, I didn't want to offend him nor the pastor's wife. But I could probably give up baklava, okay? Uh, their pastor, when they were younger, uh, was a good friend of mine, Brother Fauzi Kawaji, and he used to bring me baklava all the time, and I hated his stuff. Right? I could probably give up fruitcake. And I can tolerate fruitcake, but I could probably give it up. But give up all sweets? Right? Uh, now... Think about this. If we took this command here seriously, how would it impact our lives if we lived our lives without murmuring and disputing? I thought about that one day, and I just kind of thought about some things. For instance, what would it mean when we do our chores? I don't like to cut grass. I do it, but I don't like it. If I could... I would have my whole front yard and backyard concreted. I I don't like cutting it, but I don't complain about it anymore because I remember several years ago being down at my dad's house in Tennessee, and I was helping him when he couldn't do some things, and he said this to me. He said, son, I'd give anything in the world to go out there and cut that grass. And that stuck with me because I knew that one day I would be in that same position where I couldn't go out and do it. What about washing dishes? The same dishes over and over again. I I, I told my wife, if she dies before I do, it's all paper plates for me. (laughs) Paper plates, paper forks, I I mean, I I just wouldn't do it. I guess I'd have to get my daughter to come over and my uh, daughter-in-law come over and clean my house because uh, and I, I just doing it over and over and over again. What about the way, would it change the way if we took this command seriously, how we looked at an extracurricular activity at school, like watching a basketball game, a baseball game, a soccer game? Would it change the way we acted? How would it impact how we respond to interruptions? Do you ever have interruptions in your life? I mean, your day is all set, what you're going to accomplish, and some things change it. How do you respond to a flat tire? Amen. (laughs) I'm not quite there yet. 
The last flat tire I had, I, I didn't go out and say, well, praise God, I'm, look, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> How do you respond to an illness? That's some of God's interruptions in our life. We have planned what we think we need to do. How would it change the community discussions that we have? Well, I'm so glad that parents are getting involved in the public school uh, meetings and that setting. Uh, you know, but how, how would it change how we behave at those? How would it change how we get out of bed in the morning? Anybody else like me? Oh. I'm still not there yet. Jumping out of bed. Praise God. Glory, hallelujah. I got another day. I'm working on it. How would it change our conversation about other churches if we took this command serious? How would it change, or how would it change the way we handle differences of opinions? How would it change our discussion of politics and church, other churches? Uh, what would happen to gossip? Man, Paul leaves no loophole here. He says, put away murmuring and disputing. Instead, be positive, calm, and do your part to be at peace with others. Now, again, this is all a part of you and I working out our salvation, right? Our salvation working out of us. And here's the neat thing about this. He's going to help us. He says it right in our passage, that he will help us with these things. But then Paul goes on and gives us the payoff of doing this. Look at verse 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Now, I know that you're probably thinking, isn't he done yet? Hey, don't complain. Don't murmur, right? You got it, Verge? Don't murmur. Now, why should we not murmur? Why should we not murmur and complain? Well, number one, having a positive, positive attitude is essential to spiritual growth. Having a positive attitude is essential to spiritual growth. You know, it's hard to be blameless and harmless and without rebuke, verse 15, as long as you are a complainer. We are to live so that others will have no reason to blame us or to accuse us. That word blameless, we see that in uh, Scripture where it talks about uh, the pastor and, and the deacon, the qualifications, to be blameless. Right? Uh, blameless here means pure, uh, pure externally and internally. Uh, we are to be a people who harbor no ill will, provoke no conflict, and engage in no backbiting and slander. We're to be like Jesus, simply. And remember, his accusers could find no fault in him. So we need to develop a different attitude and learn to speak differently. James said, and I'll read it for you in James chapter 3 and verse 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. So, let me ask you, is this a major or minor thing? It's a major thing. Secondly, when we don't murmur, we become a breath of fresh air to a dreary world. When we don't murmur, we become a breath of fresh air to a dreary world. Paul says that you and I live in the midst of a crooked and perverse world. Anybody here need me to convince you of that? Uh, we don't have to be convinced of it. We know it. When we don't grumble and complain, and we are cheerful and trusting, we bring light to darkness. Now think about this. I do some work for uh, our funeral homes, and one of the funeral homes I, I work at uh, the Lord convicted me one day that I was acting just like those lost people. 
because I complained about the weather. I complained about the politics. I complained about this. I complained about that. And, and here they are doing the same thing. And here I am uh, chiming in and complaining about all these things when I am supposed to be bringing some light to a dark and dreary world. Now, folks, it is dark. And, and some of the things that's happening, I, I cannot believe that's happening. Uh, and, and, I, and I feel sorry for our younger children that they have to grow up with this. I mean, one of the difficult things is things like homosexuality. Uh, when, when you think about that, uh, when I was growing up, uh, that, that was just so far removed. And you, you just, now our children are growing up as if it's normal. And, and that's the hard thing. That's why we have to really protect our children and teach them. But here I was uh, being the same way as the world. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not concerned if I don't uh, argue and, and, and uh, complain and, and, and get aggravated. Of course we do. Right? But I'm supposed to be helping the people that are in the world to see something different in me. And even though I know, look, folks, we all know the end of the story. Amen? If you're a believer here tonight, you know it's going to get worse. I mean, we know that. So it doesn't do any good to complain and argue about it. We know it's going to get worse. And so our attitude needs to be adjusted. Right? And to let people see Jesus in us, the light of the world. I was just, uh, and some, some things just totally floor me. I was just in a meeting. I was in Tennessee this last week, and I was in a meeting uh, with uh, another fella uh, that uh, uh, works in that area with uh, some of the churches, and he was telling me about uh, the trafficking that is uh, involved right there on the Tennessee and Georgia border. Unbelievable statistics. And, and, and that's the kind of world we live in. But we need to bring light to this world. And the picture here is that we stand in stark contrast to the world around us. Not that we're not concerned. And you know, sometimes we as Christians, uh, why do we have to be mad about everything? Uh, my daughter used to say to me uh, when I'd get done, she'd say, who are you mad at today? She could tell by the look on my face. I don't know how that, that works, but say, who are you mad at today? Uh, we don't have to be mad about everything. I mean, we're saved. We're on our way to heaven. We ought to be happy about that. Right? And I'm not saying that we don't have troubles and trials and things. Uh, you know better than that. But hey, we know the end of the, end of the story. I love what Albert, Albert Barnes said. He said, the image here is not improbably taken from lighthouses on a seacoast. The image, then, is that those lighthouses are placed on a dangerous coast to apprise vessels of their peril and to save them from shipwreck. So the light of Christian piety shines on a dark world and in the dangers of the voyage which we are making, end of quote. Our light shines as we hold forth the word of life here. As we stand on the word of God, we are to shine bright. What draws people to church many times? What draws a lot of people to your church? Isn't it many times they see how we treat each other and the things that we do for one another? I mean, they're not going to get some of that from the world. When you lose a loved one, your church family ministers to you, and they may bring food. And they may go out of their way to do certain things. Uh, people see that in the world. And they're drawn to that. Uh, when somebody's moving, a bunch of guys will get together sometimes and go over and help that person. Uh, people are drawn to that. Uh, they, they love to belong to community. And if we don't do these things, then we turn that off. When we allow ourselves to get sucked into these conversations that criticize everyone, our light gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. One more reason that we need to live this way. Verse 16. Look at verse 16. 
through 18. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Paul says, you make me and others proud. You make me and others proud. Uh, Pastors are blessed. And every pastor that's in here tonight, uh, you know what I'm talking about. You're blessed when you see your people doing what you've taught them to do. Ministering to other people. Doing what's right. uh, Being positive. It's like being proud of your kids. When your kids do something that's good, you're proud of them, right? right? And you're happy about it. I find great encouragement when I see people do what they come to me for as far as counseling or something. I find great encouragement whenever I see them act upon those things. Eugene Peterson wrote this on this passage. He says, do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering, no second guessing allowed. Go into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light-giving message into the night so I'll have a good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ returns. You'll be living proof that I didn't go to all this work for nothing. Amen. Let's wrap this up. Let me tell you how to do it, all right? I always like this part. How do we do it? When you start, number one, when you start to argue with God or complain to God, learn to say, Lord, I don't understand, but I'm going to trust you. Lord, I don't understand, but I'm going to trust you. I don't know how many times I've said that to God. Lord, I've done funerals for babies. Lord, I don't understand that. I don't understand. I've done funerals for people that were killed in a car accident by a drunk driver, and the drunk driver walked away. I don't understand that. And and I've had to ask God to help me with that. Lord, I don't understand the unfair political system that we see. And I've had to tell him that. Number two, and my wife is good at this one because she lives with a grumbler. Ask someone to make a grumbling sound every time they hear you grumble. Can you imagine if we all did that tonight? Before we left the church, you hear. (laughs) But ask somebody to do that. You know, I I, I sat down and I, one week I I worked, I, I was amazed at how many times I grumbled and complained. Number three. Look for productive ways to deal with problems rather than standing around criticizing. Well, we're good at criticizing, aren't we? But look for productive ways to deal with the problems. Number four, avoid gossip. Of course, we always need to do that. That hurts a church. Avoid gossip. Number five, keep a flashlight or a picture of a starry night in a prominent place to remind yourself that we are to be like a star and shine in this crooked and depraved world. And then lastly, remind yourself that your attitude is your choice. Well, that's a tough one, isn't it? Your attitude, my attitude, is a choice. Nazi concentration camp survivor, Viktor Frankl, perhaps you've heard. I love to read some of his stuff. But he was an Austrian Holocaust survivor. He said this, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Wow. You can get bogged down with the things of life or you can choose that you're not going to let things stop you. About a year and a half ago, I ended up having a stroke and got blind in my right eye. It wasn't something I expected. It wasn't something that I counted on. 
But I wasn't going to let it stop me. I wasn't going to get discouraged about it. Short time ago, maybe four or five months ago, I was diagnosed with a blood disorder. And I, I said, I got to keep on going. I'm not going to stop. My kids, I know they care about me. They say, when are you going to slow down? And my words to them were, I'm not going to die until I'm dead. And I would suggest you be the same way. Right? <laughs> but our attitude, our attitude. Someone has written, and, and I'll close with this. I woke up early today, excited over all I get to do before the clock strikes midnight. I have responsibilities to fulfill today. I am important. My job is to choose what kind of day I'm going to have. Today I can complain because the weather is rainy, or I can be thankful that the grass is getting watered for free. Today I can feel sad that I don't have more money, or I can be glad that my finances encourage me to plan my purchases wisely and guide me away from waste. Today I can grumble about my health, or I can rejoice that I'm alive. Today I can lament over all that my parents didn't give me when I was growing up, or I can feel grateful that they allowed me to be born. Today I can cry because roses have thorns, or I can celebrate that thorns have roses. Today I can mourn my lack of friends, or I can excitedly embark upon a quest to discover new relationships. Today I can whine because I have to go to work, or I can shout for joy because I have a job to do. Today I can complain because I have to go to school, or eagerly open my mind and fill it with rich new tidbits of knowledge. Today I can murmur dejectedly because I have to do housework, or I can feel honored because I've been provided shelter for my mind and body. And then it closes with this. Today stretches ahead of me, waiting to be shaped. And here I am, the sculptor who gets to do the shaping. End of quote. Your attitude is your choice. And even though we've got all these discouraging things around us, I challenge you to live like a breath of fresh air in this world. When you go to work tomorrow, or whatever you do tomorrow, the people that you're around realize that you're a breath of fresh air. You can be a breath of fresh air. 